type 1. So this is a type 1 fracture. The other thing is the absence of a crescent sign. I'll explain this as we go on. There is a major problem here to differentiate between type 1 and type 2 Gartland, you know, because this looks undisplaced, but actually this is a fracture in varus. There has been a combination of the medial cortex. On the medial side, there has been a combination, and uh, we may not recognize in an improper X-ray. So here you have, for example, a green stick collapse on the in inner side, and that means the lower end of the humerus is in varus because of the collapse. It appears undisplaced. The other thing on the lateral view, you see that the humeral condylar axis, you know, you have a 40 degree angle normally, and here it's zero, which means that the fragment has actually gone into an extension position. So this is very, very important to pick up. When you have varus happening, then you see the overlap between the capitulum and the upper ulna, and uh, this is known as the crescent sign. So this is, is this a Gartland type 1, you know? You can see that there is obvious varus, but the surgeon decided, no, this is an undisplaced Gartland type 1, and the consequence of this, it's healed up with varus. You see loss of the humerocondylar axis, and there's hyperextension. This girl has a cubitus varus along with a hyperextension, which is very visible here. So how to avoid this complication? This is very, very important, this differentiation. The anterior humeral line should pass through the capitulum. You should not have the presence of a crescent sign. You know, the crescent sign should be absent. If there is a crescent sign present in a properly taken X-ray, well, it means that the fragment is in varus. The distal fragment is in varus, and that is why there is an overlap between these two. Type 2 fractures usually have some cortical integrity, and integri this integrity is sufficient to prevent rotation of the distal fragment. How do you manage uh, type 2 fractures? You manipulate to obtain a reduction, and you may decide that it's stable. You could just keep it in a cast. If there's a lot of edema, you may decide to do a percutaneous fixation, pass pins to hold that position. So stabilize the reduction. So reduction is stable. It requires a lot of flexion, and there is a problem of giving flexion when there is a lot of edema. So if the edema is not much, you can use a lot of flexion and then immobilize in a figure of eight cast. If there is swelling, then we do a percutaneous fixation so that you can immobilize in a lesser degree of flexion. Type 3 fractures, complete displacement. Well, we have to do the reduction, obtain the reduction, and then maintain the reduction. Very briefly, four steps. Longitudinal traction to get the position. Then you do a reduction of the fragment, so you bring it up. The distal fragment is brought forwards because it is extended and aligned to the shaft. And then you, after having verified the reduction, this actually these slides are from K. Wilkins, and uh, you see how he does it. He it's the way he does it. So you obtain a reduction, and then you immobilize the extremity by means of a tape bandage so that you can easily rotate the extremity. You confirm the position on a C arm. This is all done on a C arm, and then you pass your pins. So you can check it in internal rotation, in external rotation, and usually lateral pins are passed from the lateral epicondylar region, proximally, and you can actually turn the arm once you have bound it. You can turn it whichever way you like so that you get a proper orientation. The pin is passed at about 40 degrees from the long, long axis. So the direction of the pin is about 40 degrees to the long axis. So this is 40 degrees to the long axis of the humerus. So you pass your first pin, follow on in a lateral view, check on a lateral view. You pass your second pin, which may be parallel or can be divergent. So you cut the end of the pin, bend it, then you pass your second pin, and check on the AP, check on the lateral view. You may decide to pass a third pin to get more stability, and then again you check on the AP view. So, so you could do it from the lateral side, or you could start from the lateral side, fix the lateral side, and then fix the medial side by a single pin. And then you check the stability of the fixation on a C arm by doing passive flexion extension. Pins can be used, as I mentioned, from medial and lateral sides. Usually it is good to immobilize the lateral side, especially in a lateral type of displacement. Uh, it's, it's easier to do that, so you immobilize it from the lateral side, then pass the medial pin. This is a very stable con construct, but you can damage the ulnar nerve here. Lateral pin fixation, well, two may not be very stable in terms of rotation. 
you have to diverge the pins or you can use a three pin configuration which is very very stable so open reduction may be required just the situation i'm mentioning in a vascular injury where the vascularity of the distal part is not good you may need to explore for open fractures for irreducible fractures or where you are not satisfied with your close reduction just for completeness again i can't go into this early complications vascular injury peripheral nerve injury and a focus ischemic contracture ischemia can take place late is malunion stiffness and myositis differential diagnosis from a supracondylar fracture not a big problem in grown up children but in young children and infants you could confuse these with a elbow dislocation or a transfacial separation or a lateral condylar fracture and sometimes septic arthritis so this sort of a situation you see that x ray what is the diagnosis in this case you know is this a elbow dislocation is this a septic arthritis is it a supracondylar fracture well this is a supracondylar fracture in the nature of a facial injury this is a facial separation and typically the separation occurs in a posterior medial direction so that you tend to get a varus alignment so you check the child and he shows so swelling with a varus attitude of the limb usually it is a transfacial injury a type 1 salter harris it can be confirmed on the ultrasound where you see a posterior displacement here and this actually needs reduction but it's surprising how often they are missed and the child is presented with this sort of a picture when he is already healed up and nothing can be done about it and the child has a cubitus varus ideally this situation you require fixation with percutaneous k wires you need to hold the reduction and percutaneous the last slide here this describing this entity usually typically happens below the age of 6 or 7 years birth trauma or child abuse in a large percentage the displacement is usually posterior medial you require an ultrasound arthrogram generally we don't do a mri just a ultrasound is required if you don't have the facility you can do an arthrogram and you see the displacement you do a close reduction now here's an example of a displacement like this usually the capitulum has moved the whole lower physis has moved with the forearm you know so that the radio capitular relationship is maintained in these cases and these are common in young children also with birth injuries with scurvy or rickets and injuries with or without displacement these fractures are treated by a close reduction and fixation like a supracondylar fracture you can confirm your reduction by means of a arthrogram so i think i'll end here because of constraints of time and uh, if you have the theme next year as shoulder and elbow or wrist upper limb i'll continue then thank you very much so we continue again with uh, patricia fox who will entertain us on lower limb fractures So we go the plan is go from the hip to the ankle. So the first joint is the hip. So hip fractures were classified by Delbay in four types the transphysial the the transcervical the transtrochanteric and the intertrochanteric uh, fracture. And this classification is, is important to help how to treat these fractures and about the prognosis. So the type 1 with the trans um, physio fracture it's very important to be reduced anatomically and fixed because it have uh, it avoid uh, damage in the growth plate of the hip joint. The type 2 is a fracture is like a Salter Harris type 2 and it's very unstable because of the line of the fracture also need to be reduced and internally fixed the type 3 is more distal going to the base of the neck of the femur but it's also very unstable due to the muscle forces around the hip joint and it's to be uh, reduced and fixed 
The type four could happen in all age groups, especially now in adolescence due to these crazy sports, and it has to be fixed and, and secure, uh, reduced and securely fixed to make sure that everything will be okay. So what is important with the hip fractures in children is that all these fractures are emergencies, need to be uh, treated uh, in an urgent basis. Ne if need to be open reduction, we could uh, use the watson Children approach. If we do any close reduction, sometimes we need to evacuate the hematoma over the hip joint and we need to do a very short capsulotomy to, to do this and release the pressure over the femoral epiphysis. And if we uh, need any kind of internal fixation, we can do screws or compressor screws depending on the area of the fracture. It's recommended by the literature and in, in our experience, if the child is very young, it's safer to put a spike a cast until we have sure that the, the fracture is healing. If they are older and it's more tough to take care with a spike a cast, depending on the fracture, cast could be avoided. The femur, uh, talking about the femur and going to the shaft, when we talk about femur fracture in children, we have to consider the chronological age the bone age of these patients, the size of the child, especially nowadays that we have really big and fat uh, kids, the, if it's an isolated fracture or a polytrauma patient, and the socioeconomic factors to dealing with these fractures. The mechanism of trauma is very important, especially nowadays with motor vehicle accidents, falls, and other mechanisms of high energy. And we never can forget about child abuse, especially in young children. The mechanism of, tra uh, of trauma in, in very young uh, children, we have to remember about, about, again about the child abuse, especially in children uh, in less than one year of age. The adolescents have more due to the motor motorcycle uh, accidents, and we have to remember about pathological fractures. Less common cases of femur shaft fractures are disease like osteogenesis imperfecta, myelomeningocele, some patients with cerebral palsy and metabolic bone disease, and benign bone lesions. We have to focus on the physical exam to see the deformity about the edema of the, 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 of the local edema. We have to look for the skin in open fracture, and we have to be careful with neurological and vascular status of these patients. And then we go to the radiographs, the common views, AP and two views to have a, uh, the large picture of the, frac uh, the fracture. We have to remember to be aware that we need to have the whole bone in these x-rays to avoid missed fractures. And one of the guidelines proposed by AAOS was about chef, uh, femur shaft fracture in children. And I believe everybody knows about these guidelines and all the recommendations. The guideline is made with a collection of the literature to focus on the level of the evidence of the papers. So the guideline for femur fracture in children have 14 items. And in s most of the items, they reach a consensus of recommendation. But still in, in a very common shaft femur fracture in children, we the, the, the guideline wasn't able to recommend the, the treatment in some of these items and we are going to have to look for some of them. This paper from the people from CHOPS in the US show about the age group and uh, the fracture and associate injuries, and we can see that there is a little area when they are very young that there's no too many options of treatment, and when they are reaching the adult, 
uh, age. There's not too many uh, controversies. But we have a gray zone around 7 to 12 years of age that many treatments can be done to this age group. So considering the age and the, the personality of the fracture, the facility we have to, uh, to treat these fractures. And we have to remember w what to accept as an alignment in the end result. And we have to remember that it, this should be according to the age group. So at the older the, the child is going, less uh, deviation we can accept after our treatment. So in very young kids, less than one year, the recommendation is to use the public hormones because it assure the re reduced and decrease of the pain of the child. So until they are uh, reaching walking age, public harmless is a consensus. But the harmless could be hard, especially in distal femur fractures. So there's always a place to put the child even very young in a cast. Between six months and four years of age, so we have fractures and the recommendation is if the shortening is less than 1.5 centimeter, we can do an early spica cast, and this could be done at the emergency department under anesthesia. We can put the child in the, uh, the, in the proper table and have the cast done. The, t the tips for the early spica cast, we have to put the knee and the, and the hip between 60 and, and 90 percent, uh, 90 degrees of flexion. We do the whole cast together, not start with the leg and then join with the hip to avoid any compressions. Do not over-treat, uh, over-traction the leg because we could have any problems. And we need to ob observ uh, do observation about the neurovascular status of the patients because even a very common spica cast could have complications, especially over the skin, and could be even a compartment syndrome was described in a femur fracture after immediate spica cast. So the key factors for the immediately spica cast is the size and the weight of the child, because the larger the, ch the child, the more difficult will be to, to put this fracture in a spica cast. And in the same age group, between six months and four years, we can put the, pa the patient in traction before going to the cast. In what situation, especially when the fracture is very unstable or when the shortening is very big and in multiple injuries that we can put a 99 degrees tractions and wait until everything is calmed down and then put the child in a, in a spica cast. And we control with a radiograph three weeks after and we have to look for the deviation and in the case of loss of reduction, we can wait, wedge the cast or change the cast under anesthesia. Again, uh, go over the years between four years and 11 years, there are many treatments can be done. If it's an isolated fracture, it could be in traction and go to spica cast. And if it's a polytrauma, there are more options of treatment. One of the most useful new tools described for pediatric fracture are the intermedullary flexible nails. They are very helpful. There are lots of advantage because it's a close reduction. It's a short hospita hospitalization time. You can early mobilize the child. And it's very good for transverse fractures. But there's always complications. There's infections. The surgeons should be aware about the technique to do this intermedullary nailing. And the disadvantage of the nailing is that we have to plan accordingly to have the size of the nails according to the size of the child. And we have to be aware of these complications when we choose for any kind of treatment. Another thing is that if the patient is too big, and we have these kids big nowadays, we have to be more careful. 
especially when we don't have a transverse fracture. The nailing is good, but sometimes we have to add a spica cast to assure the stability. Another kind of treatment is this external fixator. I think most of you are very aware about the, all the indications and complications, especially for polytrauma patients, the external fixator is a very good tool for immediate treatment. The duration of the external fixator could vary, and we have in the literature from, from 50 to 100 days, and the complications there are more important, especially pin track infection, and we have to be really careful when to remove the fixator to avoid refractures in these patients. Another treatment we can do is traction and spica cast, again, the external fixator. Another kind of treatment could be a compression plate, especially when they are reaching a, uh, at the end of the adolescent years. The plates are very uh, variable. We can use in any size of patient, in any, any kind of fracture, but the disadvantage disadvantage is to do a huge plate, we need a huge surgical approach. And we have complications to do this extensive surgical exposure in children. <coughs> Another option could be the submuscular breech plating with like the minimal invasive technique that it's very good when we have a long line of fracture and we can have small incisions and to stabilize these fractures. This is an example of a MIPO technique coming from Slongo. And over 11 years of age, we can have, still could use the flexible nails, and we can have the locket intermedullary nails. The rigid intermedullary nails, there are a lot of complications, especially with the AVN. It's very important. Today, they are developing more um, implants to avoid these complications in the pediatric age group. <coughs> so we still have some gray zones talking about femur sh uh, shaft fractures, so especially in large and, and obese children. We have to be very aware about the poor outcomes over 15 kilograms. So the child's weight is a very important factor in choosing the, the treatment. And another controversial is the removal of the implants that usually we do have to remove, but depends on the patients, on the families, and the surgeon preference. So even though there are the, a huge guideline, we need to, be, to choose to each patient what's the best treatment in e every case. Going down to the knee fractures, we have the fractures of the distal femur, and we have to remember the insertions of the knee ligaments, and usually is a Salter Harris one. If not displaced, we can treat conservatively. If it's displaced, we need to do a close reduction and internal fixation. Like this one, which was a Salter Harris two fracture, was internally fixed. Complications about knee, uh, the distal femur, is of course this growth disturbance that could happen over 50% of the, co of the cases. Excuse me, can you go to some keynotes? We are okay. out of okay. time. So going down, we have the tibial eminence fractures that we have to be aware. Another fracture that is very common today because due to sports is the anterior tibial uh, fracture. And then the proximal tibia, we have to be aware about the vessels behind the knee. And the tibial shaft goes almost like the, the shaft of the femur that we can use into medullary nails. And then the ankle fractures that are very common that we have to be aware about the displacement of the fractures to indicate the treatment. And two fractures that are <laughs> special in kids over the ankle is the T low fracture and the triplane fracture that needs to be studied before doing any kind of treatment. And next year in Rio, like Zuhai said, we will all be there. <coughs>
So before we move to the last speaker on uh, pelvic and vestibular fractures, Krishna Vimala Pali, um, I would like to emphasize to all the audience to complete the evaluation forms. We are organizing this day for you and we need feedback to improve this process, especially if you have complaints. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's the last topic of the day. Uh, we and for those running away, Fikas is waiting for them with the last forms to complete. Sorry. Yeah. I'll be very quick. Uh, it's fortunate that Professor Govardhan and Professor uh, Farooq has spoken a lot about uh, the uh, pelvis and estabulum fractures. So I'm going to talk about the principle and I know it is the last lecture everybody wants to go. So I'll be af as brief as I can be. Right, pediatric pelvic fractures which are very rare and uh, you need to understand that because of the flexibility of the uh, pediatric bones there is tremendous amount of force which is required to break uh, uh, the pediatric uh, pelvis. So understandably, uh, there are lots of associated uh, 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 injuries. But fortunately, the outcome of the pediatric fractures is favorable with minimal intervention. The mortality is mainly because of the associated injuries. We all know that the pelvis uh, develops from three primary centers, ileum, which appears at nine weeks, ischium, which appears at uh, 16 weeks, and pubis at 20 weeks. <clears throat> the, the most common mechanism of injury is uh, road traffic accident, and we need to be careful about uh, taking the clinical history, including the mode of accident, associated injuries uh, evaluation. ATLS protocol should be always followed up, and pelvic uh, stability should be assessed. Moral levels uh, lesion, which is one of the pathognomic uh, 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 sign of estabulum or uh, uh, or uh, uh, pelvis. Uh, I think Professor Farooq had uh, be, uh, the best uh, clinical picture of uh, Morel Lavelle's lesion, and uh, this is the MRI uh, scan of the Morel Lavelle lesion. Pelvic inlet, outlet views, CT scan, and uh, MRI can be helpful. So, classification we can classify on tiles classification, or uh, as far as the pediatrics is concerned, we depend on. Torade and Zyg classification, where type one is avulsion fractures, type two is iliac wing fractures, type three is stable pelvic fractures, and type four is ring disruption fractures. So pelvic uh, avulsion fractures are because of the excessive contraction of the uh, muscles, and uh, this is mainly seen in, um, in sports, uh, uh, as a sports injury. Uh, ischial tuberosity is the commonest cause, which is pulled uh, by the hamstring and followed by anterior inferior relaxed spine which is because of the rectus pull. Coming to the treatment, uh, avulsion type 1 fractures, usually non-operative treatment with restricted mobility, partial weight bearing or non-weight bearing within the pain limits, avoiding sports for at least three months and uh, followed by physiotherapy and slowly getting back to the, uh, uh, the sporting activities. There are certain occasions where we might need to do the operation, especially in the older children where there is significant displacement of, uh, of ap apophysis or a painful non-union. It's uh, worth uh, talking about the ischial tuberosity fracture for a second because uh, this is prone for uh, uh, non-union and the, some of the papers quote as, as much as 68%. So the, uh, these uh, non-unions can be very painful when they are uh, sitting, uh, on, or, uh, sitting or it could be because of the physical activity. If it is painful we, uh, and if it is a small evolution, we can do the excision or open adduction internal fixation if it is b uh, difficult. But the important thing is you need to always reassure and warn the parents that it is always difficult for these guys to get back to the sporting activities. Type 2 wing fractures, which is uh, lateral compression fractures, and uh, 
This is uh, an iliac ring, which accounts for 15%. And because of the, uh, uh, the tremendous amount of force which need, there is always associated abdominal injuries, and the patient uh, usually might develop ileus, so we might need to get uh, general surgical uh, 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 input. These patients need to be admitted because they bleed a lot, and some of these patients might need uh, transfusion. Pelvic uh, type 3, which is a stable pelvis fracture, which are uh, very common, and there are lots of associated injuries, uh, especially GU or neurological, mainly in the non-operative treatment. But if there is significant displacement of symph symphysis pubis, it can be operated. Uh, luckily, fortunately, the type 4 um, uh, pelvic ring disruption fractures are very rare and uh, it is associated with high incidence of uh, 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 um, uh, genitourinary musculoskeletal or neurological uh, injuries. Mortality is very high and treatment is mostly operative. So in summary, pelvic fractures are rare and it is because of the high energy uh, uh, mechanism of injury. The mortality for the pediatric pelvic fractures are 7% seven, uh, 7 compared to 14% in adults. Uh, Open growth plates is a double-edged sword. I, if the fracture goes through the growth plate, then there is a possibility of growth arrest. If it doesn't go through that, there is a large capacity of remodeling. Non-operative treatment is uh, common in type 1, 2, and 3 without uh, long-term disabilities. As far as the associated uh, injuries are concerned, it's mainly head, chest, and visceral injuries. Interestingly, nerve injuries causing significant mor morbidity in pediatrics is very, very scarce. That takes us to the pedi pediatric acetabular fractures. This is more uh, infrequent. It is only 1 to 15 percent of the pelvic fractures. Age is the one of the important single most indicator of the outcome of the acetabular fractures. Acetabulum uh, ossifies from three primary, uh, uh, sorry, three secondary centers which appear at 8 to 9 years and fuse at 18 years. Uh, it can be classified uh, on Salter Harris classification or lateral uh, as in adults which we just heard or more commonly with Watts classification. Type 1 Watts is a small fragment of uh, posterior lip uh, uh, which we see in the hip dislocations. Type 2 is a large fragment of uh, uh, estabulum but the hip is stable. Type 3 is linear fracture with hip instability, and type 4 is central dislocation. Uh, <coughs> Buchholz has uh, uh, stated uh, this statement about 30 years ago, and ironically, it is still true even now. Type 1 fractures, usually treated non operatively with bed rest and uh, symptomatic uh, relief, non weight bearing, non weight bearing and uh, uh, full weight bearing after four, uh, eight to 10 weeks. Type two fractures, commonly associated with other pelvic injuries. Again, non-operative treatment, and uh, 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 the outcome is uh, good. Type uh, three, this is with the hip dislocation and hip uh, instability. So we need to treat them operatively or non-operatively if you can't get the estabular uh, uh, joint uh, to restore to two millimeters of congruity. Type four fractures, rare, and uh, it is central dislocation, and the outcome is always uh, uh, bad, and it needs operative intervention. Triradiate cartilage, you see it's it is a rare injury, and it is classified on Salter-Harris type, uh, 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 type of classification. The outcome of the triradiate injury is pretty bad because it gives uh, traumatic uh, hip dysplasia and limb length discrepancies. So as far as the literature is concerned, there is only one paper which was published, the longest, uh, uh, longest follow-up and largest series from Netherlands, 29 patients, uh, out of which a quarter of their patients had pro poor prognosis. And in spite of their having 14 years of follow-up, they still recommend that it needs longer follow-up. So, in conclusion, treatment mainly non-operative, and operative is gaining uh, uh, favor. Uh, the results, there are no long-term follow-up feature. Thing. Treatment summary, pediatric estabular fractures are rare. Anatomical reduction is necessary. 
MRI is good for the triradiate cartilage, and parents should be warned about the possible growth uh, defects. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, guys, I'll just take two minutes of your time, so don't run away, please. The doors are closed anyway. The doors are closed, actually. Let's close the doors. They can't run away. Okay, so well done for lasting it out. It's, it's a heavy day. It's a busy day. Uh, just two questions I want to ask you guys. How many of you would like to have the booklet instead? Just give me your hands up because we spend a lot of money on the booklet. And if you don't want the booklet, we could easily do a memory stick. Would you all prefer a memory stick? Everybody prefers a memory stick. Nobody wants a booklet. Fine. Good answer. Okay. No, no, you, you all have to give me one answer. I can't do both. Okay, just hang on. How many for booklet hands up? How many for memory stick hands up? Okay, fine, done. Rio memory stick. Let's have the presentation, please. Two minutes. Okay, one more question. How many of you want the whole of upper limb covered in Rio? Hands up. How many of you want the whole of pediatric and spine covered in Rio? Very few. How many of you want covered basic sciences in Rio? Okay, so similar responses. Fine. All of you are going to come to Rio, isn't it? Come on, you can't miss Rio. I'm not sponsoring it. Seacott will sponsor it. Is the, is the presentation coming up? Okay, fine. So the aim really in the morning when we started off at 7.45 was to give you a comprehensive review course and evidence-based update for residents and practicing surgeons on a specific theme at each Seacord Congress. And I hope we've achieved that for trauma. Would you say that, sir? Yes. Fine, great, great. Okay, brilliant, I like that. If I was a third year resident or a second year resident and if I got the whole of trauma, the whole of Brinker, really, which is what we've covered in one day with 35 speakers from around the globe, I would be very chuffed. So I hope you all have enjoyed yourself. I know it's painful, but in one day you can get it. Good. Okay, so that is done. I would like to thank all the moderators, Hatim Said from Egypt, Mandeep Dillon from India, Fatih from Turkey, Emmanuel, Belgium, and Peter Yao from Hong Kong for conducting this for us. And without their help, this would not have been possible. So thank you very much indeed, all the moderators. And uh, without the speakers, really, uh, I, I'll save time by not naming everybody, but uh, all the speakers who've come in uh, from various parts in the world, thank you very much, because without you guys, uh, this would just not have been uh, possible. So thank you very much indeed, all the speakers. <laughs> and most importantly, thank you guys, because if you were not here, there's no point running this course without, without, the, without any one of you here. Uh, for those of you who are residents and uh, are going for exams, then uh, we publish the exam corner in the uh, British uh, Bone and Joint Journal. Uh, so that's, that's a good resource to go in for and have a look while you're preparing the exam. And exactly like your vivas next door, we give you a breakdown of all the cases and the MCQs. So that's a good resource if you're preparing for exams. Uh, 2014 in Rio, we planned for shoulder, elbow, wrist, and hand, so we'll cover the whole of upper limb uh, in a day like we've covered trauma today. And then 2015, we'll do pediatrics and spine. Uh, we're also running an MCH uh, course in, uh, in Cambridge, and the modules for that would be applied clinical sciences, both upper and lower limb, uh, basic sciences in orthopedics, clinical leadership and service development, and then there's research and thesis. So if you're interested in that, there would be a uh, stall downstairs and you could speak to Shirley. Uh, so that would be commencing in Jan 2014 uh, in collaboration with the Anglia Ruskin in Cambridge. It's a modular part-time two-year course with a thesis, uh, so we'd welcome you to that. And that's all I have to say. Thank you very much and have a lovely evening. There's one, uh, one question or one comment. Yeah.
Thank you. Thank you very much and uh, have a lovely evening and enjoy the meeting. Thank you very much, guys.